congratulations on the birth of Mai. Thank you. <laughs> and also congratulations on the birth of the book as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, like it's a project that Mimi and me uh, has been doing for uh, one year. We were writing like chapter by chapter, month by month, and the month that we were in. So yeah, it's a book about like the um, the season and raising and training and nutrition eating recipes during the season. And yeah, I think I'm I'm super happy about it. Like it's a uh well written book I must say <laughs> yeah it's really really lovely and the photos are really inspiring as well and there's these beautiful illustrations as well from Max Romy um, yeah. all the way through like oh isn't it just gorgeous mm -hmm. yeah Max he was so nice that he wanted to work work with uh, us on this yeah it's really lovely and so obviously you've already written Skyrunner, which is your first book, um, and now Moon Valley Diaries, that is the second book. Um, and it's a little bit different because there's the three of you writing it. Um, what was your favourite section of the book to write? Uh, I really liked it because uh, I have been writing a bit about like mindfulness and the mental strength and I really like those parts because that means that I need to really go through them myself before I like and I need to like read a bit of, about it so I have kind of fact and then I have my own kind of uh, idea of it so I really like those parts when I need to 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 learn something and then I think my thoughts about it. Ah, okay. And what's your favorite message about mindfulness and, and running and, and eating and training? Uh, like, I think the, the three of us, we we don't feel that we, or like, it sounds so pretentious, to say pretentious in English, to, to, to say like that we, we want to give a message, but we want to inspire like people to live more uh, in, in sync with the environment, where, wherever they are. Yeah, it's a really good message and you really do get a feel for being in harmony with the seasons and in harmony with yourself and your body in the book. Um, and all the recipes look absolutely delicious as well, like beetroot hummus, carrot top pesto. That sounds awesome. Um, mm. And then um, your famous cinnamon buns, of course, and the sourdough <laughs> bread. And what was your favourite recipe in this book? Uh, all of them. Actually, the first idea that we had was that we wanted to do just a recipe book uh, by by the season and to use like yeah mainly the recipes and uh, write about herbs and everything that we have in the recipes. But uh, I think that's maybe a next step in the future for us. <laughs> and I think this book was maybe better for the place that we are now as we are at least. And yeah. Um, but my favorite recipe, uh, maybe the, the carrot uh, top pesto that you mentioned, because it's so easy and it takes care of like the whole carrot and it's so nutritious and not too many people know uh, that you could make a, like a good pesto of it. So uh, I like those kind of recipes that surprise and that are very simple. Yeah, it definitely was very surprising. I'm going to have to give it a go. I think I'm going to follow it through yeah. the seasons and, and make some of the recipes. <laughs> like you've even made Brussels sprouts sound really delicious. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And I just um I just wanted to ask you a few questions about um being vegetarian. Um because I read in the book that you you don't eat meat anymore. Um and but you do eat some local dairy products. Do you just want to tell us a little bit about your relationship with veganism and plant-based diet versus dairy? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, the first time I became vegetarian, I think I wrote it in the book too, was I, I think I was 14 years old and I, I did it because I, uh, I thought it was better for the environment. And then when I was around 20, I started to eat like local meat and fish. Um, but uh, I, yeah, then I started to like not really feel good about it when I was thinking about that animal, they have their own value and who am I to, to eat them if I can eat plants. And uh, yeah, after that, like when I was 24, maybe I, I only, I was back to vegetarian again. And as I write also, sometimes I'm really into being vegan and especially if I'm in the South and hemisphere where like coconuts grow and I can use coconut oil or coconut milk or soy milk but sometimes I also feel that okay I'm living up here it's my 
if the, the milk is coming from like the cows in the next village and I, I know that they, they have a pretty decent life, maybe I should use that milk in the coffee. You know, it's not like I'm drinking a glass of milk like this. Um, so I, um, I'm on, on and off like vegan, non-vegan, wherever I am and how I feel like Sometimes I can get into a mood when I really like, oh, I shouldn't take the little cow's milk. And then I get really like, oh, no, never. Uh, but then sometimes it's more the, the environmental part. And I think, is it better that I buy this from south of Africa? Or, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of like uh, the, the ecosystem where I'm in also. It's a difficult balance, isn't it? And mm. yeah, I think we all face these kind of problems and especially as trail runners as well. I, I really wanted to get your opinions on something that I've been struggling with recently, um, which is um, how to compensate for flying. Because obviously, like, I, I want to set up a training camp for my audience in Chamonix. Everyone will probably need to fly there. I love mm. to report on all these races all around the world. You're obviously racing all around the world, the Golden Trail series, it's everywhere. Um, how do you personally balance um, the impact of flying on the environment with your own environmental concerns? Um, I need to know. No, this is, this is the most tricky question, yeah. for sure. This is, this is what I have been struggling with since like, I joined the team and I knew that I was going to uh, travel a lot. And, and I really don't have a good answer because I feel like, like a hypocrite when I talk about it. Because like... Should I? It's my way of. It's my work. Like this is where I get money. I could just stop, but maybe in a way that I maybe can make people think uh, in like a smaller. Like what can I do as a private person? Maybe I can help to inspire these small choices that might lead to something better and like I know that many can have uh, a really bad conscience about traveling so much but like it needs to be changes from above like when it comes to to this and like categories and everything the choice needs to be done above like you, you cannot blame one athlete uh, about that because that will not change I don't think it will change if I stop traveling and I'm staying here in my farm and like I yeah I don't know but uh, for sure it's something that I've been thinking a lot about um, and like you can all, always do the obvious like pay the carbon taxes you can try to as you say where you are you, you don't need to take the car if you go shopping these kind of smaller things and maybe just be aware of that okay uh, plan the travel maybe a little bit better or that's what I'm trying to do and I'm I don't do the Golden Trail series and I, I'm actually talking about like I want to plan my year better with my sponsors so I don't need to like travel everywhere that I can like do one big travel and I do many things and many races so I'm really trying to do more like that yeah uh, yeah yeah it sounds that sounds like a really good attitude towards it I was thinking of like maybe getting the train to Chamonix because I can but then somebody in Canada oh hello Maui <laughs> Oh, yeah, you see him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's yeah. so cute. Uh, maybe you can like eat vegetarian there in Germany if you have like a. Yeah, yeah, we could do things like that. And also, I was just wondering if you have a particular website that you go to to offset the carbon, like with the planting of the trees or anything like that. Um, no, 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 I don't have. I I try to do it like in the end of the year when I when I calculate the travel and everything and um, but i i monthly donate money to like um uh, it's a swedish association that's planting trees so i do that every month at least okay yeah that's really good isn't it yeah so is it okay if we talk a little bit about your pregnancy um with my and uh and i know you've got a really good blog post about um your pre and post pregnancy training which i'll i'll link to in the description below but i've just got a few specific questions from audience members um, so, sure. Yeah. So Robin Townsend asks, when you felt ready to train again after giving birth, like how could you tell that you were ready? Um, I, I was moving, moving like straight after, like I took a walk the day after, but really training, I was like building up this kind of everyday moving because I was everyday taking walks with my or Maui or like yeah, moving my body in, in 
from day one. Uh, I don't really remember when I, I felt like I could train again. Uh, it took some time, but until then I was, uh, for some people might see it as training, but I think you just need to like, you need to, to see how you feel. And maybe I was ready for, to train again after two months or something. I did a pretty good, like, I think I did a small schema race here one and a half months after or something. And then I felt okay to, to push a bit harder. Yeah, um, but it's it's like it's so personal. So I think everyone just needs to feel how how they are feeling. Yeah, yeah, you do say that. That's the first thing that you write in the blog post, isn't it? Like you've just got mm-hmm. to listen to your own body, which is just um, really good advice. Um, and Anna Louise Shaw asks, um, uh, what are Emily's top tips on juggling a newborn while trying to return to a training program, especially if you're breastfeeding? Yeah, um, it was like it's. Uh, I think it was I. I really started to train hard in July because uh, then I felt like I had the energy to train hard, and I was like trying to prepare for CCC. But the thing with me and um, Kilian is that he doesn't have a like eight to four work, so we can like we plan our day really really well, so we can go. I can go when it fits me and when it or when it fits my not me so and then uh, the breastfeeding was not a problem um because I was like I could go straight after she had been eating and I like uh, I did the training more or less shorter or she got a bottle from Kilian so it was never really a problem and I I know that some uh, other moms or women asked about like how the breastfeeding was doing if I did a long day like seven hours and it was uh, my experience is that like the body regulated itself. Like when I did such long trainings, I didn't feel the need to, to breastfeed because it was regulated by the effort. So, but I think it's also very individual. And here is the same: you need to you need to adapt the situation that you are in. Yeah, definitely. And just go with what your own body can cope with. And, and not everybody yeah. will have a husband who's um, able to. Exactly. And then, then it's a totally different situation. Like if I, if I would have been, if Kilian would have been away or the, those weeks when he has been traveling, I have been alone. I have been either having friends coming over so I could go for a short run or I have been training inside and she has been sleeping and I have like a baby watcher so it's yeah you really need to adapt and I think that's what you learn when you become a new parent to adapt and and just handle the situation and do do the best of it yeah yeah and just yeah just go with the flow <laughs> yeah um, exactly and she she also says that um Anna Louise Shaw she said um did you have a specific return to training program or did you just do whatever you could fit in yeah, I just did whatever I could, not really fit in, but what I felt that I my body could handle. And then when I felt that I was um, like back to normal again, and that was in July, then I made like my normal training program. So in July, uh, or was it end of July? Yeah, maybe end of July I, I started to train like I did before. Yeah. And um, and how organised do you both have to be to sort of fit everything in? Yeah, we we need to be very organised and be efficient. And uh, both he and me, we have been. I think I would say that we were very efficient even before my was born, uh, but now we even more, and we plan plan the days really careful now, so we have time both to get with her and then for for our own training. Yeah, I seen um, there was a Salomon video and um, Killian's kind of holding my or she's playing on the mat and you're doing some exercises just near the mm-hmm. mat and things like that. That was really inspiring, actually. I thought, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that could be something that people could do after watching that film. Um, and did you get out running? I've seen a couple of pictures on Instagram of you running with the buggy as well. Did you do a lot of training? How did how did my kind of come with you guys on your trainings? Um, when I'm alone with her, I often take one of my trainings with her, like the easy one, and I just I jog really slow on the road uh, in the village, and I do around 40, 45 minutes, and she really likes that. Mm-hmm. And the other training I try to do, like inside cycling or running on the treadmill. 
to gain a bit more vision. Now she's really happy being outside and um, hiking and in the mountains, skiing in the mountains. She's she's really happy with that. Wow, oh, because you said a few weeks ago on, uh, on Instagram that she is about to start walking. Has she started walking yet? Yeah, she she walks with her little uh like a little trolley thing for her <laughs> oh sweet um mm-hmm. and then one last question just on the pregnancy um yeah. a lot of women who watch my channel um they're they're saying it's they struggle with comparing themselves to other women when they get pregnant or after pregnancy and how quickly they come back or how much they're able to do did you also go through those feelings and how did you sort of remain strong and true to your own self yeah, this is really hard because I can see, I know some women like coming back two months after giving birth. I, I know someone who did really, really like strong races and I I just, I before that, before the pregnancy I was really thinking like, okay, I shouldn't compare myself or like you should never compare yourself. But of course you can get inspired, but same again like we are so different we experience the different different pregnancy how the muscles are holding up and everything so it's really yeah it's no idea to compare yourself but of course I can be like oh I want to come back faster in shape and why can I do this and yeah it's it's just so personal um you should never never compare yourself I don't have any advice except that don't do it (laughs) just uh, really try to work from your own and I'm telling myself that too like I I have been really tired like in October November I felt so so tired and uh, then I needed to tell myself that okay it's no one else uh, like have experienced what I have been doing and I just need to to work from where I am even though I felt in terrible shape and uh, yeah I, I didn't want to compare myself to those who have been in really good shape just a few months after giving birth so yeah yeah <laughs> compare yourself yeah it's everybody's personal journey isn't it and in all aspects of life you shouldn't compare yourself to anyone else but definitely yeah. not during pregnancy <laughs> I'm just yeah um, but it is great to see you out racing again and enjoying yourself um, just thinking about your Kungsleden, which is really inspiring, and I really want to go and do it one day. Thank you. Are you sure it's so beautiful? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us just a little bit about how beautiful it is? Yeah, like it's uh, it's very different from the Alps because it's it's more wilderness, I would say, and a bit less uh, like up and down. Uh, this, uh, yeah, and uh, it's so cool with the hat system that it's small hats. Uh, maybe after 10, 20 kilometers. Some of the stretches I did was the longest between huts was maybe 50 kilometers. Um, but um, no, it's, it's really beautiful, the hiking, hiking experience for sure. Yeah, and you had to row at some point as well and get to... Yeah, there. many. It's, I think it's seven lakes that you need to pass and one big lake where it's like both and the other ones you need to row or you can have someone picking you up. And I, I had someone picking me up because the previous record was done like that. Uh, but you need to... One lake you need to, to row. Yeah. It looks absolutely beautiful, and I don't. I don't. Mm-hmm. I would not be going for a speed record. I'll probably do it over two weeks or something like that. A really saving mm-hmm. experience. Um, but I see also on Instagram that you're thinking about the future, and um, I w- you said you are thinking about a Pyrenees crossing. Yeah, I haven't planned too much. It's just an idea I had for uh, almost ten years now, or something, something like that. Um, and uh, if I'm gonna do one kind of project this summer, I think would be the Pyrenees crossing awesome mm-hmm. but it was funny because you were researching it a while ago weren't you and you said oh, yeah there's a crazy guy that's done it in seven days um yeah who was the crazy guy yeah it was uh, me and my friend were thinking of doing it together I don't know which year it was um maybe eight nine years ago or the year that Kian did it and yeah we read about this guy and a few years after my friend told me 
it must have been Kilian that we were um, that we were reading about the crazy guy that did the record. So it was fun. Yeah, that's a really real coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that sounds really awesome. I'd definitely be following you doing that this summer. Um, and I just have um, one last question from uh, the audience members. Uh, Peter Savage mm -hmm. says, do you fancy trying any of our classic rounds like the Bob Graham that Killian did? Yes, for sure. I would love to go back there uh, to the UK and, and do a bit of like spend time there and and maybe try to do some of the the record. The Bob Graham would be really, really fun to do and Jasmine's time there is so impressive. That's really something to, to work work um, towards. So yeah, but then if I go there I would like to spend at least a month there and do some other training and races and I really uh, uh, try to record the course um so hopefully one summer we come there that would be amazing i'm sure mm. you would be welcome to the uk with open arms and you'd have mm -hmm. probably jasmine would be helping you go around <laughs> mm -hmm. um but yeah i just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that the moon valley diaries is out now and it would make what do you think emily a, an excellent christmas present don't you think yes i think so <laughs> And also this Skyrunner as well. There's a really awesome mm -hmm. book. So two Christmas presents there um, ready for people to, to put on their list to Santa. Thank, Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, it was really nice to see you again. Yes, um, you too.